I can't even count the number of people who've seen my butt. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I have to introduce myself? Yes. I'm the, the new guy. I'm Andrew. Andrew is indeed the new guy, although you were you, you were our first guest on the podcast at the beginning of the season. Yeah, the first that repeat guest. We talked about writing. I'm the first repeat guest? Yes. Yeah. And you didn't even hit me in the face this time. That was on purpose. <laughs> I won't say which time. It was on purpose. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we talked about writing and we talked about procrastination. Mm. And given that so it is that. November and given that uh, Andrew is a NaNoWriMo veteran... That's a fair statement. I don't actually know that I feel good using the word veteran in that context, but mm-hmm. um, you were an, you were an experienced nano rimo author. Yes, survivor. Yes, <laughs> again, survivor. You're not at risk of dying, but it's I happened. Know, I don't know. My mental state has taken a pretty serious turn for the worse during. Save it for your next know. episode. Oh. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we want to do a two-part bit to talk about NaNoWriMo. So today we want to talk about how to prepare for NaNoWriMo and how to get yourself into it. Uh, Andrew, what is NaNoWriMo? NaNoWriMo is a challenge, a contest, if you will, uh, issued by the Office of Letters and Light, I believe it's called, for people to write uh, a continuous piece of work, a continuous writing uh, of 50,000 words or more in 30 days or less. Let me be more specific. Andrew, what does NaNoWriMo stand for? National Novel Writing Month. <laughs> That's, yeah. So, yeah, the challenge is to write a novel in a month. And a novel is defined as uh, any continuous piece of work of 50,000 words or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of people who go over. Oh, yes. I, I know someone who did 100,000 Um Last year or the year before. You know her, too. Yeah, I was going to say, that's... That's it's Allison. Awesome. Yeah, really? Oh. Yeah. That was not who I thought it was. Oh. I thought it would be Sammy Joe. She's quite prolific. Prolific. Everybody we reference here, of course, will be linked in the show notes, uh, where you can see some of their work, or see some of the stuff they're doing right now. All right. We'll also ha- we also have a selection of NaNoWriMo tips uh, from our, our writing group that we're part of. Um, the best of the best. And you can also find their work in the show notes. First, second, I guess, because we did nano, the NaNoWriMo definition first, mm. icebreaker. What is the novel you would most like to write? Right. Um, <clears throat> so, I don't have a specific plot in mind, um, but the person that I've been taken with the most in terms of their writing was uh, Borges, uh, and I would like to write... <laughs> a spiritual successor to his body of work. Um, What does that mean in context for you? I don't know, because he didn't... Most of his stuff was short stories. Mm -hmm. So to write a novel based on that might be stretching it, um, especially given the subject matter that he dealt with. For me... You can uh, do it in a month. I could do it in a month. Uh, For me, it would be... uh, his, the the thing the elements that uh, that his work spoke to me the most on tended to be uh, the kind of psychological and breaking the fourth wall stuff. So when you read the circular ruins and all of a sudden you kind of get where everything's going. I don't want to spoil it. So if you've never read the circular ruins, I highly recommend you check it out. It's not very long, but when that that shift happens and you realize what the twist is in the story, just you know blow, blew my mind away. And even little things like his his library of Babel and such. Mm-hmm. Just um, I don't know. It was it was the first time I think I encountered philosophy when I was in high school. Like I didn't read any philosophy in high school, but that was the closest I had come at the time because it was so consciousness expanding. And I have no idea how I would ever do something like that because <laughs> it's elements of like psychology and metaphysics and lingua- like uh, linguistics and language. Um, so I don't know what that would look like, but if I could write it, that's what I would want to write. Fair. Andrew? I have the novel I'd most like to write in the queue to be written. Ooh. Um, What can you tell us about it? What can I tell tell you about it? Okay, it's the novel. I want to write a novel that my daughter will read, and it will 
change her perspective on the world. You want her to um, stop going to loud parties and make sure that she keeps all those kids off your lawn? No. <laughs> no, I want her to... Sorry, for listeners, Andrew is old. I'm older than Jim. <laughs> and Ryan, almost combined. But anyhow. Um, <laughs> no, I read... Um, I read Fahrenheit 451, Mm -hmm. and then immediately afterwards, uh, I was slow to read some of the the classics, so this was recently I read Fahrenheit 451, and then immediately afterwards I read Slaughterhouse Five. And in the middle of reading Slaughterhouse Five, I got this idea for a book um, about a girl uh, that later becomes a group of girls that basically um, rebels against authority. in what is known as the known order. Um, so in this future, Would you describe world, this girl as divergent? Not quite like that. Remember how you didn't get slapped in the, the start of the episode? I feel like I feel like there might be a slap coming. But it, 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 it's it's a very strong female lead character, uh, but that starts out very young. Because um, my daughter's only 13. If I could whistle because I'm smiling too much right now, I'd probably make another pop culture reference. Please don't. <laughs> I've been listening to a lot of Fight the Future lately. <laughs> yeah, so that's the novel I, I want to write. Um, I'm realizing that my novel writing career is just beginning. And I have a few things to learn first before I can do this novel justice. So I have to finish... Some other things that are in the queue first before I can sit down and pen that one um, and really give it, you know, the proper treatment um, so that it becomes the book that I think it can become, which is ultimately something I'd like. I'd like them to teach it in schools. That's my goal is to get a book in a school. I guess my cool. I guess I'd want a, my book to be banned in schools. So that would be the pinnacle. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> so that would be awesome. <laughs> There's, oh my there's, kingdom for a banned book! <laughs> I don't know. I, I know you can't see it on the camera. There's a there's a John Green collection just up there, which is uh, has books that are both. Yes, <laughs> I liked this one comment. Somebody collected a bunch of Tumblr images of him with quotes from the his uh, vlog brothers things, and he's like. He's like, yeah, it's really weird to think that I wrote from a perspective of a woman. So when I say like I took off my bra after a long day, you read it in my voice. <laughs> Yeah, to each his own. Yeah. Or her own, for that matter. Oh, man. Um, so I am balls at writing protagonists, um, which is why, uh, instead of writing fiction, I tell stories about fiction, often in the context of things like D&D, where people come and provide protagonists for me. What matters to me is sort of the world and the mythology and that stuff, but it turns out you can't just write a... World, you have to have people in it who do stuff in order to want to read your book. But they can be creatures; they don't have to be people. It's true, but creatures—I mean, creatures would still be people. Like they—they they well, would have—they they would have needs and desires. And they would be so. per, they would be people, and like the rabbits in Watership Down are still people. They're not humans. Yeah, but no, they're not humans, but they're non-human people. They're characters. Mm-hmm. And 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 I enjoy writing characters, but I think for me, it's 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 about. Watching a world change. So my my sort of book that I would love to write tells the story, or tells a lot of stories about a world that sort of interacts with the subtle and different and the, and the, and the supernatural over the course of ages. Everything from an economic apocalypse where the modern world slows to a crawl and that sort of shadow world creeps to the surface because it can't cling to the underside of human society anymore to an electric earth which is ringed by tesla power and you know like like that notion of like of like transmitting electricity transmitted power that never was a real thing but is really cool to imagine terrifies me oh yeah that too (laughs) but i've been zapped and (laughs) Okay. And and that, that notion of, of of a world just uh, that, that that rises out of apoc- an, an apocalypse and you have new this this harsh blue light that casts all these brand new shadows, um, all the way to some kind of like 
space age mixed magic thing with stuff like sideways drives and artificial intelligence and like it's the story of a whole world that continually retells these myths and reuses these symbols and it just we talked about it in the writing podcast when I talked about writing as an arra- for me as an arrangement of symbols and it would I, I, I would want to do that in sort of the grossest way possible like the just the big broad strokes where you're like obviously this person represents this and this is sort of how they're interacting with these symbols in a new way um, that would be really cool but you can do it in a month I could do it in a month <laughs> I, I'm really pushing the nano. No, you're and, you're and you're right. Like that's the thing is 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 every t- the the cool thing about NaNoWriMo for me is that, is that I watch people write a book in a month, and I'm just like, the problem is not that I I can say I can't say anymore that I could never do it. I could do it in a month. I just don't. Which is fair. Many don't. Part of it is because I am ill prepared. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of torn on that subject because I'm a pantser by like tr- through and through. Um, for those who are unaware, there's plotters and pantsers. Uh, plotters are the people who map out every little plot twist and point and all mm-hmm. their characters and the world building. And that's all done in advance before they put the first sentence down. And uh, then there are pantsers who, as the name suggests, fly by the seat of their pants <laughs> and wing it. And I, I just, I wing it. Every year, this will be my fifth nano, and I, I, every year I say, I'm totally going to prepare, and November 1st rolls around, and every year I got a blank page in front of me, and I'm like, ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, but Chuck Wendig, um, if you follow him. We, we will link to him in the show notes, because Chuck Wendig is rad. He's got a blog, uh, Terrible Minds. And he just did a, a post on nano preparation, and mm-hmm. it's very good. I I won't go into it because he says it way better than I ever could. Um, so yeah, preparing is like a problem because um, you have to write for thirty days, right? So you'd think you'd at least have some idea. So for you, you sounds like your idea is kind of it's flush. It's there's enough content there that. I think you could just sit down on day one and start and see what happens. I let my characters tell the story. So for me, preparing is really knowing in my head what my characters are and who they are. I don't necessarily need to know their hair color and stuff. I can fix all that later. Yeah. Um, But I need to know who my characters are as people. And I usually open with dialogue and just see what happens. Fair enough. Yeah, Uh, it's... (laughs) <laughs> for me I always think I always think about it like I think about D&D which is my my big experience with storytelling and for there like I watch a story unfold over the course of years my my favorite remark is always that when people are like there's no way that Jim planned this four years ago and I get to flip in my notes and go back to the part where I'm like yup that is that is where I anticipated this moment I didn't push you into it but I anticipated this thing happening and everything up to this moment makes sense. And you just had that moment where you're like, everything fits together. And I, I feel like if, if were I to pants it, I would consistently lament the lack of that because I don't, I'm okay with not knowing where it's going, but I need to know where it ends up. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I had that experience with two novels ago, two nanos ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really frustrating because I didn't have that ending. I didn't kind of, it just went. And I read the story back now and it just blathered. And some of it was usable, but most of it just... It was just people talking. I was like, ah, and I was really disappointed. So I learned from that to kind of have an ending in mind. What point am I trying to make at least have that? Um, How it ends, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And prepare. uh, I killed somebody I shouldn't have. 
And that's in where, your novel? Yes. <laughs> Just checking. And that's you were the one who mentioned that NaNoWriMo gets really stressful. Yeah. No, that's where that's where preparation would have... A little bit of preparation would have done me a lot of good. It would have helped a lot. Because when I went to finish that book, um, I got to that part and I was like, oh man, I totally needed that guy. <laughs> Like, it reminded me of the time I was playing Ultima Underworld, if you remember that video game. Barely. And it was 1993, and I'm in university, and um, I'm playing this game. I'm actually watching a friend of mine play the game, and I would just yell instructions at him, and then he worked the keyboard to make the character do the stuff. Mm -hmm. And we came to this level um, with this... I don't know, crusty jerk. That's the only way I can describe this character. So we killed him. Like, right off the bat. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? And we just killed the jerk. Um, like, four levels later, the entire level was just lava. And after a little bit of research and digging and asking around, we needed lava boots to pass the level. Guess who had them? That dude we killed four levels ago. And we had to start I over. I George R. R. Martin never has that problem. Probably not. So, where he's just like, oh... Oh, they're dead. Oh, right. They're all dead. <laughs> Everybody is dead. Now you just get a... Uh, you just soap opera it. Oh, actually, no. Like, it was his twin brother that died. And <laughs> yeah. No, no. If, you, if, you, die, if you die in the Song of Ice and Fire, you die in real life. <laughs> <clears throat> I know, um, for me, um, I, need a, I need a place to aim towards so like when I consume stories I enjoy when all the plots or everything kind of fits together mm -hmm. even if it's uh, like a you know Charles Dickens it's not until you see the point where everything actually lines up like you mm -hmm. don't I, I, I can go either way on it the problem I know of when, when it comes to my writing is because I'm so amateurish I end up with like a teenage power fantasy or a rambling mess. So basically, I, I run the risk of writing something like The Last Witch Hunter, which I just saw last week. And it is definitely entertaining, but it is definitely not a good I, movie story thing. I feel like that's good. Like like the notion that 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 like you gotta you've gotta write that to like get it out there, mm -hmm. and you can see what it looks like. And but in, I think in order to write not that it's in the same way that with anything you have to make bad art to make good art yes and the, yes. the goal isn't just make good art it's just make art and a the bunch create. of it will be junk yeah mine would definitely fall into whatever the male version of a Mary Sue is I would totally Mary Sue Larry Stew I would definitely Larry Stew for, for serious the oh, hell out of you. it and and I know that that would be bad there's just nothing good to come I Larry would Stew. love to read the tale of Huckmaster the Barbarian Huck, Huckmaster, King of Blades, King of Reason. Cuts you in half with his wisdom. Oh, Lord. Um, Stop. <laughs> I, can, I, I can make a confession right now. I'm going, I'm going to cap the confession. When I used to work in the factory, I'd, I'd tell myself stories. And I would basically Larry Stew myself through a bunch of different fan cannons and insert myself into the stories and then tell a what-if story. And I went through several... I'm not going to say what they were, because that would be mm -hmm. far too embarrassing. But I, I've done stuff like that, mm -hmm. just because I'm working at, in a factory. You need something to keep you awake. 8 and, to 12 hours. Yeah. And so, yeah. It's like push-ups for your imagination. Yeah. And so I've done something like that, where it was just an ultra-male fantasy. I can tell you one of them was like a Dragon Ball Z story, just <laughs> to give you a sense. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Third Dan, Huckmaster. Huckmaster is now the name of... Any fictional character based on based on Ryan, I've decided. Huck, Huckmaster the Wizard. Well, Huckmaster the Many Colored. Huckmaster the Dragon. Like as opposed to Huck the Magic Dragon, who's a different dragon. That's an entirely different dragon. It is. That's a good idea, and you get, your ideas have to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, I, I think I think creating those kinds of stories is is good, even if they're the kinds of stories you don't want. Mm. Because it gets them sort of out there and it gets you, in order to create something good, you have to in part know what something bad looks like. It's like um, grading. Mm. If you graded papers or, or tests yeah. in university or something, you 
in order to find out what the good stuff is, like you can read you, you can read good stuff and be like, that's good. Mm. But in order to know why it is good, a lot of the time you have to read a bunch of bad stuff, or you have to understand what because re- reading something that doesn't give you what you're looking for tells you the kinds of things you were looking for. It's true. And I don't throw anything out. I don't know if, if you do when you write, but I keep a folder that's just slush. If and I- everything I write that I don't like, mm-hmm. even if I cut it from a novel, and it can be like totally different characters and anything else in that folder, I put it there. I cut it into a slush dump. I now want to do like a bi-weekly audio reading from your slush folder. Oh, God. It would be amazing. Bum, bum, it would be so da, terrible. Oh, it would be awesome. <laughs> it would be so bad that it would be good. Okay, now the sweet. Like completely out of context? Yes. Oh, out of context and with like adverbs coming out your ass. Oh, yeah. On, no, the, purp- on, on the purple is prose. Oh. You should go go back and... Uh, so many flowers. It's we, just uh, we had a video a couple weeks ago uh, about... Uh, it was a dramatic reenactment that uh, Ryan Consul and I did. Uh, from an article I wrote at Matt Art Lab about a book. I've been reviewing books there as the book nerd. But uh, about Planet of the Wizard Bros, which is not the name of the novel. It was The Khan's Persuasion by Cynthia Felice, but it was it was not great. <laughs> um, but it was so purple and so brotastic that... Yeah, I've written... All of my poetry is like that. Every piece of poetry I've ever written is just fantastically shitty. Fantastic. I have, I still have almost all of it before I, before I started keeping everything I, I used to. Ironically, Andrew's on. song lyrics quite good. Thank you. It's song lyrics are hard. I've, it's, it's, I find those tricky. I could not write thirty songs in a month. Well, the challenge I think for songs is uh, there is a challenge. Um, I know a musician in Toronto who does it every year. Uh, she is amazing. She's part of uh, Copy Red Lear, uh, Leslie. And it's like 40 songs in 60 days or something. Mm, and so it's hard. it's tough. That would be tough. But uh, it's part of it is just having an idea for 40 distinct things. Or in, or in the case of NaNoWriMo, having an idea that pushes you along through the whole thing like at the end of whatever this novel is someone is going to look at it and go what is this about mm-hmm. you know like it's about a person who does stuff and like no 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 like, like you read something like um The Great Gatsby and you're like what is this about it's not just about Jay Gatsby doing things it's about you know the jazz era and the, the sort of weirdness of being rich and like there's all kinds of it's, yeah. it's it's about early 19th century America, and you know, or you read even something like Dragon Riders of Pern, and you're like, what is this about? It's about defending various ideals, ideals, but it's also about immersing you in this world that has its own language and its own terminology and its own customs. Yeah. And there's um, a screenwriting book out there called Save the Cat. Put it in the okay. show notes. I can't remember the author. Right. Yeah, no, we'll dig it up. Um, it boils every movie down into ten things. There are only ten stories in the world I've got a book. that can be told. I got a book. We'll put it in the show notes as well. It's called the Seven Plots. Same, yeah. same deal. Yeah, though. same idea. There, there is a finite number yeah. of stories to be told. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's basically like rags to riches. Yeah, and. Um, well, it's the only one that comes off the top of my head, but usually it's some sort of fall from grace story. Yeah, there's the, the the love story, and every love story actually has two love stories in it. There's the A story and the B story. And mm-hmm. The B story is actually always a love story. Mm-hmm. Um, these are, but mm. the the great thing with with that is once you have the idea, once you know what it's about, um, this is where the creativity kicks in. This is where um, writers really kind of. Um, Thrive in the idea world because um, once you have an idea, the fun is in screwing with your characters, and all you need is to just keep finding ways to mess them up because you've got this transformation that occurs in your story. Everyone starts out in a in a specific state, 
and you, you kind of know where they're going and you know what state you want everyone to end up in. And the story is really only interesting if stuff happens in the middle. Yeah. It's the, and the, it's the, the finding sort of- those, oh, what can I do to them now? Oh, you know what? Car accident or so-and-so dies or I give them like rabies or you just you torture them to keep them from getting to where they're going. I reminded uh, <laughs> Sid Meier, um, a game designer, he, he ran for Access. He designed some of the you know, best strategy games in the world. And uh, he did a he did a game jam at University of Michigan. This is about like eight years ago now, but there's a great video of it that I will put in the show notes. But in it, he he competes in this game jam, um, sort of for funsies. And uh, he his his whole theory of game design is you have a player, you have an objective. Add complications and just keep adding complications until it is fun and stop adding complications when it stops being fun. And that's it. It's a good model. Like it's, it's just he's just like, you know, so so the the game that he produced, he's like, you have to reach this door, but you're in a maze. Um, which is, you know, okay, well you can walk around this maze, but um, there's zombies in the maze, so there's a there's a complication. You can't get caught by the zombies, but they're slow and you're quick. Um, but sometimes um, there are fast ones, so you have to worry about that. But you have a gun, which helps you deal with the fast ones. But every time you shoot a fast zombie, it spawns two slow zombies, and stuff like that. Like it's it's. Just layer it's it's and he describes games as these layered complications. Uh, Bernie Suits describes them in the same way in the Grasshopper. He describes them as uh, voluntarily overcoming unnecessary obstacles. And it seems like what you're describing is that same sort of notion of yeah. you're placing obstacles in the way of these people from or these characters from reaching their trans their transformation. Yeah, you're you're basically your job as a writer is to is to be a sociopath to. For your characters, you're you're that jerk pulling the strings and just getting off on their misery and heartache and problem I, and just I don't know. I think be a jerk. I think there's lots of ways to do it without misery and heartache. Well, there's, I do it there, misery there are, and heartache that are still that are still interesting. I should mention I don't write love stories. No, Andrew <laughs> Andrew writes like crime and thriller novels. Yeah, yeah. People die, and there are there are some really terrible people in in my my book. I'm gonna. It's gonna be really interesting for me to go back and watch this video because throughout the entire time of you two talking right now, I just came up with an idea for something to write over <laughs> November. Um, it would basically the premise would be it's like take the page master or like any child story. Basically, yep. like a child has to go down to the store to pick up a carton of milk, and shenanigans like gets kidnapped by pirates you're describing like every children's book exactly um my most favorite one of those of course being matthew and the midnight tow truck yeah but because i didn't read them i'll just make it up as i go i highly recommend (laughs) matthew and the midnight tow truck alternately you are also describing the plot uh literally describing the plot of mermel 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 by robert munch she is going to the store and then she hears Mermel, mermel, mermel. Oh, don't don't keep talking. I don't want to and know. And then there's a baby. This. It's it's been about 24 years since since I've read Robert Munch. I've successfully forgotten. It it, it has been yeah. probably about the same for me, and I have forgotten almost none of it. Yeah. And that's another place to get ideas from, right? You can take something simple, childish, innocent, and turn it on its head, make it dark, or take something dark and make it sickingly pleasant. Um, just you just have fun with it, right? Like that's the whole idea is you just have fun creating. Mm-hmm. So Jason Voorhees falls in love. That would actually that be would awesome. be a great story. I would read that. I would read the the Jason Voorhees Michael Myers totally mute slash fic, <laughs> as opposed to the slasher fic. Uh, Picking up what I'm putting down. That's what you're here for. <laughs> but, 
Um, but yeah, so I mean, having an idea is, is, is one thing. Andrew, how do you get in the groove? What is your recommendation? Like, well, how do you, how, once you, once you have an idea, you have to then sit and write for 30 days. Yeah, so I can only speak for myself, someone who has a day job and a wife and two kids who have activities and all that other sort of stuff. If you boil it down and insomnia, um, so if you boil it down to the the time I get to just write, it's a small number of hours by comparison to mm-hmm. all the other stuff in my day. So I'm kind of wedged into this window that I have to write then or I don't write at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and my problem not in November is I take that time and I do something else. Mm-hmm. Because that's the only time I have, and God damn it, if I want to watch Sherlock, I'm going to watch Sherlock, because fuck you. Understood. <laughs> Can I swear on this show? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, finding the groove for me is really hard, because for 30 days in a row, and I should be doing this every day as a writer, but I don't, you got to sit down, you got to write, and the worst thing you can do is just sit here like this, not writing anything. So, to find the groove... Um, if I'm having trouble getting words out, I I take a really simple object, like a pencil. This one happens to be a mechanical pencil, so that's good news for me. And I write a story about it, just to get the words going. And mm-hmm. I imagine that this something happens to this pencil. It can be really innocent, like it falls into my glass of water. I won't, because it's your pencil. Thank you. Um, and now I've got a drowning pencil. And I create a little story around that just to get words flowing. Okay. And then I, I, I do that in a separate document. The drowning just... pencil, by the way, sounds like an assassination tool from Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> it could work. <laughs> yeah. So I do, uh, and I have to, I need silence, but not silence. So I've got an app on my phone called Coffitivity. <laughs> and it's just a coffee shop recording. Yeah. Weird. And I put that headphone, and it's just, it's background noise, right? Oh. And I'll have a separate document over here, and I'll write about my pencil, and I'll be having a great time, and words will start to flow, and the, the pencil will get a name, and it'll have friends, and things will happen to the pencil, and, uh, and it'll be going. And as soon as I feel it coming, like as soon as I feel that those words just coming naturally out, I alt-tab to my dock where I was. And you start writing about pencil? No, I start dialogue. I, I always start with dialogue when I'm stuck because I can imagine someone talking and I can imagine their mannerisms and their tone of their voice and okay. the way they inflect and that gets me into the story um, so I've got words now and I've got a character who's saying something and if he's angry okay I got his arms waving and I, and I, and I start writing that down he's yelling at somebody his arms are waving and, and then I usually kill somebody Jesus. When in doubt, With murder a character. Pencil? Well, uh, some, I'll do something exciting. Fair enough. Right, because yeah. it'll get my heart rate up, and it'll get the words going. And then once you're going, you just don't stop. So when you read Andrew's books, you can find out when he uh, got tired or bored by uh, punctuating it with uh, the deaths of characters. I wonder if this is also what George R. R. Martin does. It could be. like, But for me, uh, uh, something exciting will happen. It's not always death. Mm. But I, I try to get, like, I can't write a love scene when I'm stuck because I just eh, I can't really feel it. I need I need to be very full of emotion in mm-hmm. that time. Um, so for me, to find that groove, I need a real specific set of circumstances. And, I got, and, then, and then you have to do that every day. Yeah. Um, you have to sustain it. Um, and it requires a lot of patience on from those around you. I find so my children and my wife are very generous with their time with their patience <laughs> for November because they know that at any moment I could just run out of the room and grab my laptop and write something Sue down. Sue yourself in the cone of silence for <laughs> I I don't have a cone of silence but I have like sequestered myself like a to a corner um for 24 hours. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um I know I know other people that have different ways to find the groove like mm-hmm. the oh yeah I think it's music and it, I think it's definitely different for everybody Ryan how do you how do you get in your groove um 
so it's been a while since I've written anything over a long period of time. Um, I mean, it took my it took me two years to write the thesis. So clearly I wasn't writing every day because <laughs> it was less than 100 pages. Um, I think for me, if I had to speculate on what would, it would take for me to succeed, it'd have to be highly um, habituated or at least ritualized. So mm. it'd have to be... That's what makes you lawful run. Yeah, it would, ha- it would have to probably be like a particular time of day and a particular commitment. So for example, right now, um, and this will probably be a shout out to a future uh, episode that Jim and I do about habits... Um, one of my daily habits is to read one page because on a crappy day, if I don't feel like reading, at least I read one page. But if it's a good day, all I need is that one page to get me going. Mm. And so I think it'd have to be something like that, that I'd have to have like a 350 word, um, starter. I don't know if I'd stop after 350. I might continue on if, if I feel like I've got Uh, something. 350 is like, well, that's like a page and a half. Yeah. But I, I, I think I would have to have a particular time of day, you know, shut out um, the, 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 just the distractions like phone and, and internet, um, but not like I'd probably go down to a coffee shop or something too. Something that there's stuff going on around me that I could use my environment to, to inspire me, but not something that's dead silence. Ooh, um, daycare. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Especially if I'm going to be writing a story about a person going down to the grocery store. Um, so I think those are some of the things that I would need to do to find a groove. Uh, and also, I tend to be a long form writer. I don't, um, when I write, like when I wrote my thesis, it was all longhand first. I, really? I, I went back and I typed it in afterwards. Well, you've seen my show notes. <laughs> That's about as good as it gets. That's quite legible, honestly. That's, That's as good as it gets yeah, for fine. me. And I can't yeah. cursive. I can't, yeah, I can't like, write cursive. You can see I, I can write small. You write tiny. Yeah, and yeah. fairly neat. Young eyes. <laughs> so... For our listeners, Ryan's writing is very small. Uh, Andrew's writing, he thinks it's messy. It's not particularly messy. I tried really hard, though. Yeah, but you won't be getting an MD anytime soon. I want a gold star. Silver I'll star? I'll see if I can dig one up. Yeah, so I, I, I write everything longhand because uh, then by forcing myself to write it and then copy it onto the computer, then that usually is where the editing starts to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it'd be a particular time of day. You just have to... It'd have to be bookended by particular things. So, like, when I go to the gym, for example, it's after work, but before I go and, like, do groceries. You know, and because the grocery store closes at 11, I have to get the gym in first and then go do groceries. Mm. So it, it gives me that that fixed time point. We have a friend who gets up at 4 a.m. Oh, yeah. She's hardcore. She's crazy. Um, and she gets up at 4 a.m., and that's what she does. She grabs mm. her tea... It's up before, and she cracks her knuckles, and boom, she writes when the world is silent. Please tell me it's not a typewriter. I don't know, but I'm going to ask her tonight. <laughs> I, I, can, I, can, I can totally imagine, and then she's got like Sean Connery in the background telling her to punch the punch key. the keys <laughs> for Christ's sakes. So yeah, I can see, and I've had advice given to me by some very successful mm-hmm. writers that even if it's 15 minutes, mm-hmm. right, yes. and I, I have just never done that. And I think I'm going to start because I've reached the point where I'm tired of not finishing something. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I think it ultimately comes down to, so like you have a lot more experience, whereas me, I'd I'd be trying to set these habits up, but um, in in, in reflecting on me going to the gym over the last year, it like once I finally found a system that works for me, it's good. It may not be somebody else's system and it might not be a system that works for somebody else, (laughs) but I found a system that works for me that helps me to keep going. Uh, and then that's like the, the best part. Like you, you read the biographies or you read about how other people work and their processes and their productivity and you just steal all the bits that work for you and then fuse it together until it works. For me, like, so I am most creative when I am in a room with at least one other person, usually two to three, I do all my best stuff with like four people and no rules. Which again, like it's that's John Cleese style. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's and that is that's where that's where I am funny. That's where I'm funniest. That's where I am able to extemporize and improvise you know so that's where I can do a lot of like theater or performance stuff that's what I do when telling stories or doing poetry or things like that as I, as I'm um, and I have this 
I my, my term for it. I don't think I ever finished the post on this because I could never figure out enough about how it worked. But it is is awakening the dark my my darkness. There is that moment when your fingers get all tingly and loose, and you're just like, "Ooh, oh." And that's when my because what I'm what I'm looking for. Usually, it happens when I get together with a bunch of friends from out of town. And we all roll up characters and we're going to do a thing. We have no plan. There's no like, you know, yeah, I made these notes two years ago. No, no. no. It's like, it's off, entirely off the cuff. We're going to tell a story tonight. We're going to play a game tonight. What is it? And I go looking. I, I sort of look at a bunch of parameters. And I go hunting for that answer. And it's always there. And there's that moment of like epiphany. Where I know what needs to happen. And I know what elements need to be in place to make this a fun and interesting story. And we just do it. But doing that on my own, alone, I find really challenging. Like, I need... You feed off people. Almost. Oh, totally, yeah. Like, like I, am, I am a creative extrovert. In the sense that, yeah, like, I... I I have written songs by myself, but the songs I write with you or the songs I write with Kaylee are vastly better. Uh, because there's... All you need is a hug. There's a back and forth. Yeah. We still have to record that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, and it's the kind of thing where, yeah, you can, instead of writing a song over, like, the course of, like, three weeks, you can write a song in, like, 20 minutes or an hour. Um, the uh, the lullaby that we, we wrote, uh, I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, we did it at the Poetry Slam a few months ago. Uh, back in summer, actually, was uh, that was like two hours of just chords and words, and like there were tears first time we played it. Nice. <laughs> it was it was really sort of flattering. That's cool. But well, but yeah, it's like it's 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 one of those things where once I have that feeling, once I once I I'm possessed by that certainty. It's easy. It's like Tetris. It's here Here are the pieces. Here are the symbols. Here is where they need to go. But until I have that, it's just nothing. I, I Developers, I don't know if anyone knows any people who write code in this town. Um, Maybe a you know, a <laughs> few. Um, I do work at a software They company. call it flow, right? Finding mm-hmm. flow. Mm-hmm. Where it's just tunnel vision. And everything is just flying. Um, I love that feeling. I that's like I write just to feel that every once in a while, and it mm-hmm. doesn't happen often. It happened to me once in the whole month last year of November, where I did more than five thousand words in a day. Wow! And it was just everything was just working, and oh man, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And that actually I've noticed the other thing is I, I now, um, for the past year, I've had a job that really uses a lot of creativity. I spend all day solving problems, imagining new problems, and trying to solve them for future people. And it is sort of mentally taxing in a way that a lot of my other jobs haven't been. So I find that I have a lot less of that energy, which is weird, I think, because that's not how it works. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> because, like, I'm the same. I, I work all day. I'm at, mm-hmm. at work for 7.30 in the morning. And when I get home from work, I just want to take a nap because I'm, I'm mentally mm-hmm. beat. Mm-hmm. And then I, but I got to do dinner. I got to get the kids to wherever they're going, homework, projects, whatever the fuck is going on. Yeah, I, I don't have any of these things. Right? So I don't even really have to make dinner. So yeah, to just you just sit and you go, oh. you just you long to get that spark. I, I feel like that's where the Chuck Wendig comes in. I mean, Chuck. As much as I, I, I will, I will, I will talk flighty about awakening my darkness. I understand the Chuck Wendig answer, and the answer which I subscribe to. I started reading um, Chuck's blog when I was working on my thesis. Is that even if you don't have that feeling or that groove? Right anyway. Yeah, art harder, motherfucker. 
Um, <laughs> that's I love his slogan. I want it on a mug, but I can't put, have the mug anywhere. Um, yeah, you got to do it anyway. Um, I read a great quote, and I'll find it. And it is, um, if you only write when you feel like it, you might be a fairly decent poet, but you'll never be a novelist. Mm-hmm. And I'm finding that out right now, having had several hundred thousand words under my belt. You're a fairly decent poet. I am a fairly decent... I'm not even a decent (laughs) poet. Um, So uh, I'm actually going to start taking a class or paying a writing coach simply so that I am... It's costing me something. Mm -hmm. And I am... working with a personal trainer. I am more cheap than I am lazy. And it will kill me (laughs) to be forking over money with no result. Um, just so I can yeah. do it even when I don't have to. Mm-hmm. And and it will be surprising to me, and maybe it won't be surprising to me, how much more often the spark will happen as well, a result. reminds me of, I think it's a Picasso quote of um, inspiration finds you when you're hard, working hard or something like that. Something like that. That is the I kind of thing Picasso would say. Yeah. Although I, I just read another story about his where somebody said, I'll pay you to draw a picture on a napkin. He draws the picture. Did you send that to me? No. Okay, but anyways, he draws a picture on a napkin, slides it over, says a million dollars. And the guy's like, what? A million dollars? It took you five minutes? He goes, yes, but it took me ten years to figure out how to do that in five minutes. Yep. Um, <laughs> I picked that up from Ken Stacy. Nice. Uh, Ken Stacy, he's a, he's a comic illustrator. Um, he's a super cool guy. You can also see him at Desert Bus, which will be happening in November. Um plug for desert bus because desert bus is awesome they're a week-long marriage charity marathon where they play desert bus for or they play desert bus from smoke and mirrors Penn and tellers game and uh they uh raise money for child's play which donates cool. toys and video games to children's hospitals and uh but uh, and ken stacy does the ken stacy value hour there so he auctions off all kinds of cool stuff last year he, one of the things he auctioned off were he illustrated astro boy for a while Ooh. and so there was blueprints original blueprints in a in a case for Astro Boy. Uh, which was there amazing. Would be people interested in that for sure. It, it was it was really he's always got really cool stuff. But but I, I saw him and he always did these these uh, uh, sketches at cons and stuff. And um, he people people are whenever they're looking at his art they're always they, he says they always ask him how long did it take you to do that? And he always says the same thing. He's always like fifty years. They're like, what do you mean? It took you. It took you fifty years to draw that. He's like, yes. I mean, you, he's like, but, but I've seen you draw stuff in five minutes. He's like, yeah, but it took me fifty years to learn to do it in five minutes. And it's that notion of, of for I think the sentiment for him is that it's not just about the thing that you produce. It's about all of the expertise it takes and the time and the experience it takes to get you to the point where you can produce that in any amount of time. Mm-hmm. Which I think. It's best summed up by the phrase, art harder, motherfucker. Long live so, Chuck. So our next episode, unsurprisingly, Andrew will still be here. Unsurprisingly, the video configuration will be basically the same, but we will tell, talk to you all about how to survive and thrive in National Novel Writing Month. So I am Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Andrew. We're signing off. Get writing. Do not googly eyes on your ass. Do not show my camera your butt. <laughs>